Welcome. This is going to be my critique of the Unit 1 quiz or practice test. So your test questions will be very similar to the ones that we have on the practice sheet here. So, but they will be slightly different, so you pay attention on the test. Okay, so here we go, number one. What does the three uh, graphically represent in the following equation? Okay, so we're multiplying on the outside here with the three, so that is a vertical stretch. Nice easy one. What does the 4 graphically represent in the following equation? Well, the mother function here is the square root, and so this is the adding on the inside. Adding is always the shift, and the inside means it's horizontal. So the 4 here represents a horizontal shift. And the shift on the inside is actually the opposite of the added number. So the shift will actually be in the negative direction to the left, but the 4 does represent a shift, whichever direction it means. What does the 9 graphically represent? Well, the mother function here is absolute value. The adding of the 9 is on the outside, so that's going to be a vertical transformation, and adding is always a shift. So answer B, a vertical shift. Rewrite the following quadratic equation into vertex form. Okay, so we're going to take this bad boy here. We're going to group the x squared and the x term, so x squared plus 6x. And then we're going to go leave room to add a constant. And we're going to add a number or a constant to force that to be a perfect square trinomial. That's why this method is called completing the square. And then we're going to have the 31 hanging on and outside here, the parentheses. So notice if you multiply the 1 here times these guys, add them all together, we're still looking at this. So this is equivalent. Now, to complete the square, how do we complete the square? Well, the pattern is... Half of 6 is 3, so that's going to be this guy here. So I'm going to make that quadratic up there equal x plus 3 squared. And so this number here comes from the 3 squared, so that's going to be a 9. Oh, by the way, this is f of x is equal to this. Sorry, I got lazy. So notice we added, uh, there's a 1 out here that's assumed, of course. So we added 1 9 to the right side of the equal sign. So on the same side, to cancel that positive 9, we had its opposite, negative 9. Now, if you multiply all this out, you get x squared plus 6x plus 9 plus 31 minus 9. The 9s cancel, and you end up with right where we started from. Only well, here, we're going to group the 9 inside with these, so that makes this guy x plus 3 quantity squared. And 31 minus 9, that's going to be positive 22, I believe. Yep. So f of x is equal to x plus 3 squared plus 22. Answer C. Okay, this one here, a little bit more complicated form because we've got a coefficient on the x squared. So what we do is we're going to group the x squared and the x term still, but we're going to factor 2 out. Okay, so this is going to be 2 times x squared plus 2x plus some constant that's going to force this quadratic in parentheses to be a perfect square trinomial and then minus the 17 of course and here's the key uh, not dividing this by 2 that's the most common mistake if all you do is multiply back every time you factor you'll never make that mistake 2 times x squared is 2x squared 2 times 2x is 4x bingo this is the same as that then I go to complete the square. So half of 2 is positive 1. And then 1 squared is going to be positive 1 here. Now, here when we put a 1, and there's, you know, f of x is equal to out here. When we add a 1 here, we actually added two ones because everything in the parentheses multiplied by 2. So we just add a positive 2 to the right side of the equal sign. So that means on the same side, I add the opposite. Negative 2. We group those together. There's our answer in vertex form. f of x is equal to 2 times the quantity x plus 1 squared minus 19. So 2 times the quantity x plus 1 squared minus 19. Answer B. Describe the end behaviors of the following polynomial function. Well, 
Uh, even degree polynomial functions are both positive infinity on both sides, but when you multiply them by a negative leading coefficient, they'll both be negative infinity. So answer D. Now, what happens if that what I just said doesn't make sense to you because you didn't memorize that or you just don't know it, okay? Well, you can reason this out fairly easily. Just say, hey, I got some function. When I go out to the left, x is going to be a really big negative number. So what's a negative number times itself six times? That's going to be a big positive number. And what's that positive number times negative one going to make? A negative number. So on the left side, we must be going down towards negative infinity. So as x gets more negative, f gets more negative. And then we do the right-hand analysis, same thing. Well, on the right hand, we're going out towards positive infinity. So x is going to become a really, really big positive number. So a positive number times itself any number of times is a positive, so this would be a big positive. But that big positive times negative 1 is going to make a negative. So there we go. There's where, you, there's where you come up with our rule. We have an even degree leading coefficient. I'm sorry, we have an even degree polynomial function with a negative leading coefficient. Both left and right ends go to negative infinity. Here, same thing, only this is odd, but it's got a negative leading coefficient. So on the left, when we put a negative number in here, a negative number times itself an odd number of times is a negative, and that negative times the negative coefficient is going to make a positive. So we're talking one of these two guys. That eliminates C and D. And then on the right end, as x gets to be a big positive number, same analysis. A positive number times itself any number of times. 3 qualifies as any number of times. is a positive, and that positive times a negative is going to make a negative. So, not that guy. So, answer 8. Positive infinity on the left, negative infinity on the right. Those are then behaviors for this polynomial function. You're going to see when we start graphing this how useful that is. It's like incredibly useful. Okay, find the roots or determine the roots of the following polynomial function. So I'm going to factor. So it looks like 5 is common. So that's going to give me x squared minus 9. And again, the key to factoring is always check, multiply back. 5 times x squared is 5x squared. 5 times negative 9, negative 45. Whoa, that took 4 seconds. And then I'm looking at the uh, this guy right here. It's technically a quadratic. It's got an x squared as a leading term. But it's a binomial. So I'm looking for a difference of squares. And it is. So this is 5. And then we have times x plus 3. And then times x minus 3. There's our factoring for the difference of squares. And for roots, there's no root here because when can 5 equal 0? Well, there's no variable here. So it doesn't matter what x is. 5 is always 5. That's why we call it a constant. It doesn't change. So it's 5. It's never 0. Now, this guy is 0 when x is negative 3. And this expression is 0 when x is positive 3. So what are our roots or our zeros for the function? Or you could say x-intercept. All three of those terms mean the same thing. x-intercept, 0, root. They are plus or minus 3. Answer B. Same question here. We've got a quadratic going on, a constant, added to a variable expression, added to that variable that's squared. But everybody's got a multiple of 3 as a coefficient. So we're going to factor out the GCF. Now, the GCF is a constant. It's not a variable. So there's no root with that. Okay? This is actually going to be a horizontal, uh, I'm sorry, a vertical stretch. And we'll cover that when we do the graph in here coming up pretty soon. So we take 3 out, so we divide everybody by 3, so that's going to be 1x squared, looks like plus 3x, and minus 10. And I multiply back and check, 3 times x squared is 3x squared, 3 times 3x is 9x, 3 times negative 10 is negative 30, check. And this is a quadratic, and it looks like it might be factorable, so I'm going to assume so for the moment. And if it does factor, it factors to a pair of binomials. Since the 10 is negative, we know that one constant is positive, and the other constant has to be negative. Factors of 10 that have a difference, when I add them up, they're going to make 3, right? But they're different signs. So 1 and 10 have a difference of 9. That's not going to work. 2 goes uh, 5 times into 10. 
there's my difference of three right there. And the bigger one is positive. And again, here's the thing. All the time, kids mix these up. They put x plus 2x minus 5, which means your answers are the opposite of correct, which means they're wrong. Okay, so just check. Multiply, you should get negative 10. Add those, you should get the, the b term in the middle, the positive 3. 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. 5 added to negative 2 is positive 3. Check my factoring killer. And so that means when does this guy equal 0? When x is negative 5. And this factor equals 0 when x is positive 2. Looks to me that's answer D. Yep, see, if you get those mixed up, I got the sucker answer waiting for you to pick. Don't be a sucker. Okay, same question, find the roots here, but I notice, hey, everybody has an x to the first in it. There's something common here, a variable. So we take x out, factor x out, that gives me 1x squared, and then 12x, and then 32 ones. And that's the quadratic. We've got a constant, add to a variable, add to that variable squared. So I'm going to assume it's factorable for the moment. And if so, it'll be factorable to two binomials. Now, positive here says the two signs are the same on the constants. Positive in the middle says they're both positive. So this is x plus some positive number. And the other factor is also x added to some positive number. Now we're looking for the factors of 32 that sum, because the signs are the same, to make 12. Well, 1 and 32 makes 33. That's way too big. 2 goes in 16 times. That makes 18. That's a little too big still. Uh, 3 doesn't go into 32, but 4 does. 8 times. Hey, and those guys add up to make 12. They're my huckleberry. So x plus 4, x plus 8. I double check. 4 times 8 is positive 32. 4 added 8 is positive 12. Check. Killed it. And then it's like, okay, so when is x equal 0? Well, when x is 0. When is x plus 4 equal 0? when x is negative 4. When does x plus 8 equal 0? When x is negative 8. There's my three roots. So negative 8, negative 4, 0. Answer A. Okay, that took us uh, less than 15 minutes. I explained as I went. You know, you guys should be working kind of close to that speed, not way slower than that, because you're only going to have 30-minute class time to get your test done. Ten questions very similar to these. Okay. Walk in prepared. Because at the end of the period, you have to submit what you have. Okay. So keep that in mind. You don't want to just be accurate here. You want to be proficient where you can do it in a very reasonable amount of time. Not a long, long amount of time. Okay. So it's important for you to know that and prepare for that. And then have a kick butt first test grade. That'd be cool. All right. Other than that, if you have questions, it's a tutoring thing. So talk to Mr. Beardsley. That's what he's there for. He's a good guy. He's a good teacher, I think. So you guys are lucky to have him. It's hard to find a long-term sub in math. So you guys are blessed without even knowing it. Have a good one, man. Later.